um, in capillary filtration that we talked about before with any random capillary, right? We said as we move through a capillary, right, as we move through a capillary bed, we said that so this is just a regular blood capillary, right? We said there were a couple pressures that were important. There was a blood pressure, and the blood pressure dropped as you moved through the capillary bed. So it was high at the arterial end, and it was low at the venule end, right? And we said because, just at any capillary bed, because the filtration slits are, are selective by size, large proteins don't get pushed out. So as a result, there's a higher osmolarity in blood plasma than there is in interstitial fluid, right? So there is an osmotic pressure that remains relatively constant as we move down to them. We probably could abbreviate it a pi or something like that. Okay. At the arterial end of a capillary bed, right, blood pressure was higher than osmotic pressure, so filtrate got pushed out. At the venule end of a capillary bed, osmotic pressure was greater than blood pressure, so filtrate got pulled back in. And this was important because this helped us maintain a constant blood volume, right? Uh, and it allowed us to do both, you know, delivery of substances to these cells and taking away of waste from those cells. So, so this filtration and reabsorption here, I guess, you know, occurred across capillary beds that go artery capillary vein. But here we don't go artery capillary vein. Right? Here we go artery capillary artery. So this number, guess what, doesn't change. This number stays constant too. So in essence, this number is going to stay constant like this, like that, so that at any point along the cap, because we go artery capillary artery, so that at any point along this capillary bed, there is a pressure pushing out of the capillary, right? So, so as long as blood pressure is, is high enough here, we will always push filtrate out. And we push out a lot, right? We said of, 80, of uh, all of the blood that comes through this capillary, a fifth of it, 20% of it, gets turned into filtrate and stays out there. Right? Now, that can't be the end of the story, though, because the structure of this is kind of like this now. We are... That filtrate that we're producing can't disperse, right? It's getting collected by this funnel, by Bowman's cap. So here, we have an afferent arterial coming in. We have the glomerular capillary bed here. We have an efferent arterial going out here. So that's our direction. And we know we have a blood pressure that is pushing out here. So we have a blood pressure pushing out there, what they call hydrostatic pressure. So I'll say pressure due to blood. blood pressure. Pushing out. Right. We know we have an osmotic pressure again here, pulling back in. Right. So the net of these two is that if blood pressure is higher than osmotic pressure, you're going to make some filtrate. But as you start making filtrate in here, as it collects, where does it have to drain? has to drain out this proximal convoluted tube. Now, imagine a funnel. If you start pouring water in a funnel at a rate faster than it can come out the bottom end, it's going to overflow, right? And that's what happens here. We've established that the rate at which you make this here is huge, right? 125 milliliters per minute. You make a, you make a lot of it. Okay? So as a result, this is going to fill up. But the structure prevents it from flowing out, right? So if you look at this here, as this fills up here, it can't spill out over top. So where's it got to go? Back inside the blood. So we have a pressure due to the buildup of fluid here that's now also opposing this blood pressure and pushing back that way. Because it can't overflow, it's got nowhere to go but push back into the blood. And we'll call this the uh, capsule pressure, the pressure due to fluid buildup in the capsule. So we have those three different pressures that we have to resolve at this capillary bed that are a little bit different 
than a typical capillary bed. We have the hydrostatic blood pressure. This is a pressure pushing out. We have the colloid osmotic pressure pi. This is a pressure sucking back in. So that's a positive pressure. That's a negative pressure, right? Sucking back in. And this fluid pressure created by fluid in Bowman's capsules, this outer end with regard to blood, back into blood. So is it negative or positive? It's negative also. So the resulting pressure, the net pressure, the net filtration pressure, if you're going to make filtrate, this net pressure has to be positive, right? So we got to make sure that our blood pressure is higher than the com combination or the sum of these two pressures here. Does that make sense? Otherwise, if it weren't, we're going to be in trouble with regard to the amount of, of, of filtrate that we're going to produce. Now, I hope I get these numbers right. They're on the next slide, but I want to write them down here. I always kind of forget them a little bit. But in general, this can vary from glomerulus to glomerulus, but these are, these are rough averages. The rough average of a hydrostatic blood pressure here is about 55 millimeters of mercury. There. So that's a positive 55 millimeters of mercury. I think the colloid osmotic pressure is usually in the neighborhood of about 30 millimeters of mercury here. And the capsular pressure, hopefully they come to the right. We'll look them, look them up in here in a second. The capsular pressure, I think, tends to generally be about 15 millimeters of mercury. There. Everything else being, if we're at homeostasis, so that when we resolve these, 55 minus 30 minus 15 gives us a net filtration pressure of about 10 millimeters of mercury. Were my numbers right? Uh, different textbooks use slightly different numbers, so so I wasn't being cute. It's just that different textbooks you gotta gotta use slightly different numbers. Um, but the point is this: now, if we the first step of the kidneys being